This here is a USB cable. And, as you might be guessing, it is in fact hooked up to this ESP8266. It's just wired into some of the GPIOs right there. And it has a little resistor right there to indicate that it's a low speed device. So we're not talking full speed, not yet, you know, until Espressif gives me access to an NMI that's GPIO triggered. When that happens, well, we'll talk. So far, I have no luck with that. And it's kind of neat that I just started asking some questions that had nothing to do with it. And uh, Pablo2048 there guessed on his first try that yes, I am actually trying to get VUSB working on the ESP. But this video isn't about VUSB working on the ESP. It's much more about the design processes and, well, processes I use in order to make things work. It's how I do most of my projects. So first of all, I don't really know that much about USB, and though there's this massive amount of documentation out there, and an amazing Wikipedia article, and about three other websites that talk about it in depth, they're missing a lot of information. And on top of that, VUSB, that was for the AVR, a software USB stack, is just, it's so hard to understand. So one of the things that I'll do is I'll start with things that I do know. So I have this USB mouse right here. And I can hook that up to a USB cable that I've cut in half and I can just wire in some wires directly into this logic analyzer. Now personally I prefer the, uh, the much smaller Chinese knockoffs of the Sele, um, but when, uh, when I have to I will go bust out the expensive one. I don't actually own this one and so thank you to my friend who is letting me borrow the really expensive one. This is a, uh, I believe a Logic 16, or sorry, Logic Pro 8. Um, but uh, yeah, these, when you, when you need to go do some serious hardware debugging, uh, Sele is really the logic analyzer to go with. I also have an existing dev board that I know work and I know how to program. So that is right here, and that just hooks up to my laptop through this USB thing. And on this board, I have it set up with this little brown jumper here to make it so the ESP always boots into flash beam mode. It's like it's just holding down the flash button. And that's because whenever I do any of these projects, I recompile a lot. And that recompiling has to happen as quickly as possible. I really can't be um, inconvenienced with having to go click some buttons and some dance or anything like that. I just have to try something. Nope, didn't work. Try something. Nope, didn't work. Try something. Nope, didn't work. At any rate, I can look at both an existing USB device right here, it's uh, that mouse, and I can also look at the ESP, and I can look at any of those signals on this logic analyzer right here. All of this all works together to help me have an environment that I can really, uh, really just test things quickly in. Let's take a look on the computer side. Okay, so here is my, uh, my project, I guess just some of the code for it. Um, this video is going to be kind of long, so if you do get bored, I will not ding you for leaving or not watching it. I just wanted to try something new. Uh, anyway, I have a, a bunch of terminals open, each doing their own thing. Uh, so let's just start with uh, taking a look at this, uh, the Sele logic analyzer here. I'm going to get it all plugged in and ready to go. Um, some of the things that I think would make sense to show you guys first is, well, what does USB look like? So right now, I'm, uh, I'm going to click start, and then I'm going to plug in the little uh, USB mouse and move it around some. So this is a USB mouse moving. And let's, uh, let's see what this signal looks like. So right here, channels 4 and 5 are where I have the, uh, the, the, the mouse. And um, one of the nice things with... Uh, let's see here if I can get this to actually go. With, uh, one of the nice things with Sele is that it will um, do basic uh, uh, analysis of the, uh, of the signals. So, and this is actually really frustrating because I didn't even know it supported USB until much, much later in the project. So I spent like hours training myself on what these stupid signals meant and then I just found some button inside of the, the Sele logic analyzer thing that just says like, oh, here's all the data. So I, mean, I guess you learn something new every day and that was a very sad thing that I've learned. I guess happy, because now I know. Um, anyway, let me switch that to uh, 
the hex. So with USB, it um, there's really uh, three common modes, I guess, before USB 3. One was low speed, which is uh, right here. You can see it's, uh, oh gosh, what is that? Let's resize this some so you can see it. Oops. Oh, come on. Okay, so uh, there's USB uh, 1, and it has both full and low speed modes. Uh, full speed is 12 megabits per second, and I think I can do that with the ESP if Espressif gives me access to the NMI and uh, enough uh, IRAM to actually go do this with it. But for right now, I'm just going to attack low speed, which is what the VUSB software stack did on an AVR, uh, entirely in software. And the low speed is at 1.5 megabits per second. So between these two peaks here, it's about 0.66 microseconds. Um, and for USB, it's differential. So we have both a data minus pin and a data plus pin. And this is the same for a, a lot of a lot of protocols that are that are done in this sort of uh, communication. So like Ethernet is a differential protocol. Even PCI Express is differential. Um, uh, HDMI, just basically almost all protocols nowadays are differential signaling. And there's a lot of really good reasons behind that I won't go into here. But the basic idea is whenever uh, the D minus pin is high and the D plus pin is low, that's a, a logical zero. You can ignore that number there. It's or a logical, yeah, zero. Then it goes one, zero, one, zero. And what we have here is a preamble. And this thing uh, basically starts with uh, 101010, and then as soon as you see uh, a 1, which, by the way, I forgot to mention with USB, uh, these don't indicate 1s and zeros. It's the change that indicates uh, what the bit is. So because we're going from a 1 to a 0, or a 0 to a 1, that means the bit right here is a 0. And then the bit right here is a 0. 0, 0, 0, 0. But now they're the same. So now it goes from 0 to 1. Oh, hey, that's actually how they do the decoding down there. That's kind of cute. So this 0 and 1 is, is actually legit. At any rate, because it's the same bit, we now know it's a 1. And that's called NRZI encoding. Um, I don't really want to go into why that is a thing. At any rate, uh, so once you see the 1 here, it indicates it's the end of the sync byte. And now it starts transmitting data. So it has a code here. So this is PID setup. That is a, um, a, a packet ID and the, the command is setup. And USB has all of these, these basic uh, just different commands and different aspects, CRCs on the ends of messages um, and all of that. And so some of these messages like this one here are being sent to the mouse. Then the mouse responds and says, ah, I've gotten it. See, PID ACK. Ack means I've gotten it. And there's this back and forth communication between the mouse and the PC and the mouse and the PC. Now, it's there's a lot of kind of ins and outs that I, I just didn't know and I really couldn't find online. So if it weren't for having the uh, this, this analyzer, aspects about when the data one packets and when the data zero packets need to happen and what needs to happen after an ACK and all of that, I didn't know any of this. I didn't learn any of this in school. I didn't learn any of this. And the resources online are, they're good, but they aren't for somebody who wants to write a stack from scratch. So whenever you do these sorts of things, having a logic analyzer and being able to look at these signals is a huge help. And not just because the, uh, the, the signals themselves are uh, you know, decoded here, but even without that, which by the way, remember when I first started this project, I didn't even know that existed. Um, at, at any rate, uh, logic analyzers are just really helpful at just about every level of, of debugging and working on these sorts of things. Um, I really like the Sele logic analyzer software. Um, I, I hope they don't sue me for saying that many Chinese knockoffs will sometimes work with their software coincidentally. Um, but uh, in this case, I am using, I mean, I, I frequently use their hardware. It's just this one is a, a nicer version of their hardware than I normally use. I don't own the, uh, the Logic 8 Pro, but I am borrowing it. So at any rate, 
Logic analyzers, big thumbs up. They're a huge help with all sorts of uh, debugging. Another one, um, I guess it kind of goes without saying, that I, I do use Linux, and it really is helpful because it does give you access to just seeing exactly what's going on at the hardware level, and it's really fast with USB. It doesn't do any of the nasty caching stuff or any of the confusing stuff with Windows does. It just, just plug and play. It just runs. And it gives you access to the hardware in a way that's, well, really helpful. Uh, so one of the things I can do is I can say uh, sudo mod probe uh, USB mon. And once I've mod probed USB mon, I can then run Wireshark. And if I'm running Wireshark, um, I can see all of the packets going into and out of the, uh, the system. I'm actually going to unplug the logic analyzer there so it's not quite as chatty. But right now, if I move the mouse, you can see the, uh, the packets rolling on in. And that's because these packets are coming from the mouse. So if I unplug the mouse, and let's uh, reload this, and I plug it in, then I can actually see in a very clean packet way what's really going on. So I can see here the host right there, host is connecting to the mouse and saying, hey, give me a descriptor. And here, I can see that the mouse is responding to the host with a descriptor. Descriptor just describes what the device is. And Wireshark is amazing for this sort of thing, especially when you run it on Linux and you get access to, I mean, it's great for packets, for debugging networks, for all the way down to right here, I'm using it to debug USB. It's just a great, great thing. Um, at any rate, uh, so the descriptor comes from the device, and I was able to go look and say, okay, in real life, what do some of these descriptors look like? So I could just go around, literally, plugging in different devices and looking at their descriptors, and what's really amazing is that, I don't know who did this, but whoever bothered sitting there and writing all of the stuff to make it so it, it gives you, like, look at this. It tells you what the request type is. It tells you all of this. It doesn't just give me bytes. So I don't know who spent, like, their life going into Wireshark and adding these filters, but that's just a huge boon. Um, things like this, the uh, request configuration, I could see how it responds. So that was really, really helpful because when I'm developing my device, I go plug it in and nothing happens, and nothing happens. I can go here and I can see device. Oh, hey, look, it got a device in, and I would see that it would fail at certain other parts, and I would be able to go look at why it failed. Wireshark would go explain like, hey, yeah, you did this invalid thing. And it really was just a huge help. Um, so that's that's the main part there. Some of the other things that I thought were a lot of fun were when I was first working on this, um, I, uh, I didn't know assembly for the Extense architecture. Extense is the chip that's used in um, the ESP8266. Um, so I had to just start learning uh, learning some extensive assembly. And I found a bunch of things online and all of that, but I couldn't really find much that talked about how long each instruction took. So uh, I tried doing this in GCC inside of my C files. The syntax is just atrocious. So this is just me calling a function from inside my C function. And then I can, actually I can just show you what that function is that it was calling. Um, and that's that function right here. It's my funk. And I probably spent maybe 30 or 30 hours or so just learning, just playing with the, 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 the compiler and playing with the assembler and, and, and trying stuff and recompiling. And lots and lots of Googles, um, just tons and tons of, of, of just, I mean, I don't know, I think in 2000, last year I had 15,000 Googles. That's like a couple hundred a day, I guess. So I, I Google things a lot. I don't know these things. I just am really good with searching the internet for them. So yeah, if you find solutions to things, post them. You know, go ask questions publicly. Don't email people privately. It's, it's really helpful. At any rate, so I, um, I wrote my functions. And I started learning about how the stack works and how the, uh, you push things and pop things and 
just there's some really annoying things about extensa like there's no instruction that will move a 32-bit value into register instead what it has to do is it has to move it from from a relative place in flash into the register which is annoying because then you have to have a pointer to the things so but thankfully gcc handles that so it can just do this here but I, I noticed that things like that's a very slow operation, whereas loading something with an offset, so uh, I have a, a register A14 which points to a table, which I'll show you in a minute, and um, that goes and it loads that into A14. This is a, a hardware register, and registers are like little buckets that are, are exist in the processor that are super duper fast. So I could read in that register really fast. I can set that register to that small value really fast. Um, and one of the neat things is when you read these things, so like I'm reading uh, the data that A14 is pointing to in RAM plus a constant offset and then reading that into A4. On a lot of architectures, that's really slow. Whereas on the, uh, this processor here, it's one cycle. As long as you don't need to use it the next frame, that's, this executes basically in one cycle, at least it only issues one, and then you can do other things in the next cycle, and then you can go use that data. Uh, so, going on about why I made this function right here the way I did, it was so that I could have code here and here, and anything between those two that aren't commented out, it times. So it, it, it loads this A9, and then it loads A11 with this value called C count, which is the clock count. So I can count exactly how many processor cycles, how many 160 millionths of a second each one of these instruction takes. And I learned a lot. And I started doing things about like stifling and all of that because I really wanted to try to make this so that it would be um, uh, uh, compatible with the 12 megabit USB. And uh, it's really complicated because 160 doesn't evenly divide into 12, but uh, you can do other tricks that I'm gonna, you know, eventually hopefully try, but just not, not yet. Um, so what I am gonna show you now though is, let's see, the list file. So one of the things I would do is I would start playing with this, and I would play with my C code as I would start learning the assembly, and I would see what actually goes on. Um, so I would go say, you know, write a small function and see what it looks like. Let's just see what this one looks like. And so I can use the compiler and, uh, it doesn't turn into a function. Um, let's try, sure, whatever, let's try that function. Um, what I can do is I can write my C code and then I can look at what the compiler decided to pop out, uh, assembly wise and uh, just reading what the compiler does and then changing something and then recompiling it and then looking at what the compiler did has been a huge help. Just being able to learn from the compiler rather than from books online. Um, so that's, that's just been, been a, a really useful like learning tool for me. Um, some of the things I was able to do is I was able to actually uh, like start listing out all of these different operations. So here I, you know, do this and then do this and then do this and then do this, and I would run it a lot of times and see how many cycles it took. So I was able to learn that uh, you can use this command, which here, this command here, which branches if a2, uh, the bit zero in a2 is set, it jumps to here, and it jumps over this code right here. Now one of the interesting things is. Sometimes that operation takes three cycles, and sometimes it takes two, so I spent about two hours just sitting there trying to learn why. Why is this the case? So I aligned my code at different spots, different spots, and I found out that whenever the last two bits of the, uh, the address there uh, that the, the jump label is at are one, it takes three cycles. So I could reliably now, I know in my code, be able to do jump over uh, three cycles and the amount of time that that code takes is exactly the same to the instruction, um, which is, is just great because now it means that I no longer have to have a timer if I ever do want to try this USB at 12 megabits thing. Um, so let's, let's go back a few more steps here. Uh, to, in order to interpret USB, uh, 
it's it's really complicated because there is the differential aspect. There's this bit stuffing thing where if you see uh, they're they're the same for six cycles, the seventh cycle has to be flipped, and that doesn't actually mean a zero. And there's so many things going on. It's it's an incredibly complicated uh, like thing at the the lowest level. And uh, so what I did was I, I started looking at the logic analyzer and I took these packets and I would just write them out in this thing here, this, this, this table code, to just play with it. And this, this code here is in C, um, so I don't have to actually wait for the stuff to compile it. It goes very, very quickly. Um, done. And I can test it. And I can take a look at, okay, well, what do I think this means? When I see one, zero, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, and that is, that goes back to the, uh, Oh, it deleted it, didn't it? Oh, well, I can go back and look at one of these. Um, so, like, I represented this is a one state, or sorry, this is a one state and this is a two state. So, um, I would pass in, uh, like, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, one. And in my code here, I would have in this table one, two, one, two, one, two, one, one. Uh, there it is, two, 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 two. And I would try to interpret that, and I would try to learn what that, that actually does. Um, and so one of the things that I did is uh, I started to just simulate my code running on it. Now, if I want to interpret that there, it actually takes all of this code here. For every single bit that, that it has to interpret, every 1.5 1, 1, 1. millionth of a second, or if I can do the, the USB 1.1 full speed, 1 ton, 12 millionth of a second, um, I have all of this code here has to run. There are a lot of things going on. Just a ton of things that have to happen and you have to check for and you have to jump around and you have to test. So, there's no way this would work in that little bit of time. This would also produce a fair bit of, of code and I just don't have the resources to execute all that on the ESP. Thankfully, there's this magic of tables. So what I can do is I can pre-compute all of the possible inputs, outputs, and states of the system. So like how many ones has there been? What was the last state? All of that, what is the current D plus and D minus pin doing? What is, what's going on? Because, which by the way, with USB, it's not just differential. It's differential until you get to the end of a packet, in which case you have to detect when both lines are low. So it's, it's just obscenely complicated. But you can take all of this and you can pre-compute it into a single table. In this case, this table, I don't remember quite how big it is, uh, 64 entries, 64 bytes big, is enough to do all of this code right here. All I have to do is I have to set up the data that I'm running into the table. See here, I'm just taking bit one and bit two and oring them together in the appropriate places. And then I can just look up in the table what the state is. So here, when I'm running along, I have this, this, this current state, and that's just a number because it's, it's represented in the table. And I go and I read, 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 one bit at a time. Which, by the way, you also have to detect when you've left the preamble, so that's yet another thing you have to do. But conveniently, the table can handle all of that for us. So now, all of this work up here has been boiled down to a single instruction. And this instruction right here in extensive assembly can run in about three cycles. Because you have to, uh, well, four cycles if you want to clear out the bits. Um, so now all of a sudden, this pretty complicated thing becomes within arm's reach. Um, so this is just a one bit at a time table. I'm making a, another project where I'm trying two bits at a time. Um, what this does is it means that I can uh, interpret two bits at the exact same time without any extra added uh, like slowdown. And that's all of these instructions here, which is even longer, and that can execute that fast. So at any rate, I, uh, I will go, I work on that table, and um, I have it in RAM, and now what I had to do was I had to get an access to the GPIO interrupts. And uh, I did that just the same way Espresso said to do it. Um, I started learning things about their instructions, like they have a command that says disable interrupts. But I could go back over here um, and uh, look at the, uh, 
the assembly code for uh, their interrupts if I can. Oh gosh. Uh, I don't know where it is, what the command was. But I could look at their command for how they actually disable interrupts, and I could go write my own function. Um, so there was disable interrupts LCL. I was able to condense a whole function call down to just these four lines of code right here. Then I just started writing my code and, um, and testing things, just in iteratively testing. So first of all, can I make a debug pin? Debug is actually a really important thing, because like when I'm running my code here, I need to be able to have some way of understanding what's going on inside the ESP. And the way I do that here is I have a wire that's leaving the ESP and going into the logic analyzer, and I can control that wire in code. So here I say debug high, debug low, debug high, and those correspond to the lows and highs on this logic analyzer line right here. So without printf or anything like that, and there's no way you'd ever use a debugger for this, you can really understand a lot about what's going on inside of the ESP. So I could uh, go play with the timing, you know, have this loop that waits, all that, and I can be monitoring these debug lines as it goes. Um, so yeah, that, that's how a lot of that part goes together. Um, one of the next kind of big parts is just understanding this table. So the ESP does not have any facility to um, to immediately load something like an absolute place in memory it takes a while because it's got to go back to uh, the flash to find it. Um, but one of the things that we can do is we can go look up into this table here. And what I did was I made the first couple bytes of the table something completely different. Things that I would need to know. So things like the GPIO uh, base. Um, how many times to loop before timing out. Uh, a mask for using this table, a uh, pointer to uh, uh, internal USB state, um, that's in a different thing elsewhere. And just by storing everything in this table here, I can just keep the pointer to this table stored in R14, or yeah, R14, wherever that is, right here, USB RAM tables, R, er, sorry, A14. And then whenever I need to read all, out those variables in a single assembly instruction, a single clock cycle basically, well, two clock cycles if you have to wait on it, I can read that value from that table into this register. So it's, it's a little bit awkward to have to store your, all of your constants in a table, but it does make the code smaller and faster. Um, as I was going, just go writing the stuff, let's see here. Um, so for 1.5 megabit USB, uh, it's 53 clock cycles at 80 megahertz, or 54 every third, because um, if you divide uh, 80 megahertz divided by 1.5 megahertz, you get 61, wait, oh, ha, huh. okay, yeah, that has actually happened to me a number of times before, so decimal. Okay, you get 53.33333 cycles. So what I do is I, I say 53 cycles, but then every third cycle, I go add in an extra cycle of weight. That's what keeps me in sync with the USB, despite the fact that I don't have any clean divisor. Um, I have a whole lot of fiddly code. It's just interesting, the way like with assembly, the way that you can think and the way that you operate is just so different than C. Things like uh, here as I'm inside, it's very much go-to oriented. So the idea is like, well, if I'm going to br uh, branch if this bit is clear, so if bit one and register seven is clear, uh, go here. But then I can just jump from here over to write cont. So I don't even know where that is. That's somewhere else in the code. Um, but you can arbitrarily jump around. So that's, that's just neat that it's a way that you can do that. Um, and so I have this assembly code that executes on the, uh, the GPIO change. Unfortunately, it still has to go through the Espresso SDK, so it's very slow to get here, but once it's in here, my code is very fast. Um, so from here, depending on what happens, whether I receive a setup or SOF or an in message or data from the USB, I can then go call a C function. So I can do all of my normal coding in C. Uh, that's a lot easier for me because my brain, you know, though I, I like assembly, it's it's very hard to build anything out of it for me. I, I don't know how Chris Sawyer made uh, the, the 
theme park game, Roller Coaster Tycoon in assembly. It's just beyond what my skills will ever be. Uh, at any rate, so I have all my code. I can go jump out, call C code. C code can do stuff in a much easier, uh, higher level way. And I can call assembly functions from C. So here I have USB send data. And that's actually a, uh, a, a thing in here. Um, And so in here in my C code, I or my assembly code, I go handle counting out and sending a data sending data back to the host. Um, and so just going back and forth between C and assembly is, is pretty fun too. Um, I feel like I've exhausted most of the uh, the details that I really wanted to touch on. Um, I do have this available up on GitHub. I did not initially develop on GitHub, so you can't see my code as it had been changing. Um, but uh, yeah, it definitely is there. One of the things I have started doing since two days ago was uh, this count. Um, so at least I do intend to start monitoring how many recompiles I do. Um, see how far that can go up. Um, I hope you guys liked this, this video. Uh, I'm just not going to be editing it or anything like that. It's just much more informal. Um, if you do like these sorts of videos, I can try to record them in the future. Uh, just, just give me a heads up. Thanks. One of the, uh, the big debug things I forgot to mention is that I do leave memory spaces just totally unused so I can go shove debugging information into them uh, just kind of willy-nilly whenever I need it. Um, so like right here I have uh, just a zero in this table, but I do shove data in there in order to like say I don't know what this register is at this one point in this one function. Um, so I can put it there and I can look at it later. And uh, the same goes over here in the the, the C code, there are cases where I do want to do things like I have a debug flag right there for whenever I want to see, I, I don't know what this value is, what is going on here? When this function right here gets called, well, what is buffer out? I, you know, sometimes I'll be crashing and I'll have to narrow it down and I have to understand where the problems are and that's just uh, one of the ways I do it. Um, so I don't really ever use a debugger or anything like that. Um, let's see here. Uh, I want to show you guys what it's like to make burn. So what I'm going to do right now is plug this in and that's hooked up to there and then this thing is the ESP just kind of chill in there and it immediately boots into the please burn me mode so I'm gonna burn it connects it flashes it and uh, I need to make that as fast as I can so that I can uh, not waste time and right there I can see that the ESP is booted and it's sending me all this debug data so every single maybe one-tenth of a second I want to see, well, what is the last packet I got? These are those two debug values I mentioned. Um, I don't remember what those two things are, but uh, if I ever needed them, I'm sure I would find out fairly quickly. Um, so right now, I'm going to go plug this into my laptop here. So this is the USB plug hooked up to the, the ESP, and I can see uh, it starts to update with all of the information that I was trying to get debugging. And uh, one of the neat things here is DMESG. The reason I'm recording this video is because just a little bit ago, I finally got the ESP to identify. So right here, look at that. Input. C and lore. ESP USB. I have is just some sort of bogus uh, PID vid pair and it enumerates as a hid device and check this out if I go take the the mouse and I put it somewhere it's moving on its own that's because the uh, USB stack right now is emulating a mouse it's emulating that mouse and pretending it's moving <laughs>